Bounced twice, of course. When the bomb blew up, we got the air wave, right, initially right from the blast. And then the second blast, when the um, reflection of the wave, when it hit the ground, it came back up again. Bounced the airplane a second time. As the last airplane in the run, in a reconnaissance model with the cameras and all the other gear on board, we were told that the cloud would be about 40,000, 29 as we went by, and 40 something coming back. After we made the big U-turn and headed back for it, the cloud obviously was over 60,000 feet then and going up. Um, my aircraft commander made a decision for which I'm eternally grateful. I'm not going through that cloud. So we made a big sweeping flight around it, but not through it. After we got back to Fairchild and they hosed all the airplanes down and a couple it took us away and checked us all over and took the pocket dosimeters and all the bang meter and all that crap out of the airplane. They hosed all the airplanes down on another part of the field. But then we read in the paper how successful the, the, the test was. <laughs> I've always felt the vice itself. It wasn't quite that successful. Desert Rock, when we first got there, was just a spot in the sand. And we went to the, I remember we went to the far end of the road, and that's where we set up our tents and everything in our motor pool. And as other outfits came in, they filled in from where we were at up towards Mercury Junction, different companies. And it was just, uh, just rows of tents. And that was it. It was strictly all just army troops. There wasn't a lot to do out there. Our outfit was pretty lucky. We got to go on road patrol when your name came up, and we patrolled the highways from Desert Rock to the railhead at Las Vegas with our wreckers and our little trucks and toolboxes and everything, and any military stragglers along the road or breakdowns why we'd stop fix them. If we couldn't, well, we would tow them in. First shot that I remember, we were just on an open hillside facing ground zero. And just before the shot was dropped from an airplane, they told us to turn around and put your hands behind your head, put your knees up, you know, and put your head between your knees. And that we did, and you could, you could just feel like a blowtorch going across the back of your neck when the blast went off. And then you could feel the pressure hit you. I remember one guy that was in our outfit, he got excited or something, and he jumped up just before the blast hit, and it just knocked him flat. After the heat wave went by, and, the, and then the blast, and the noise and everything, then we could turn around. They said we could turn around, and I remember seeing the mushroom cloud then. This huge, big mushroom cloud that was beautiful, really, all colors was boiling from the outside, you know, up and around and back in the bottom and going up and up and up and a big ice cap formed clear over the top of it. You would set an aircraft at a tank or something so many yards from ground zero or so many degrees, you know, it was all pretty well documented. Then afterwards, why, they would go back and take what measurements they could, if, but most of the time it was too hot to get back in there. One airplane was turned, well, it was facing the blast, and afterwards, it was 
set in the right angles. It had been turned around halfway, a big bomber. And I think one of the most unusual sights that we saw was a, a tank. I think it was uncle shot. And it was, when we went out to look at it, the, the turret had been fused right to the bottom of the tank from the blast and the heat. It was just like one piece of metal instead of a turning turret. I come back one time, I had two captains with me. And in a jeep, we went up to look at a tank and a command car and the Geiger counter went off to scale and I told them we had to leave and they didn't want to. They wanted to go farther and I wouldn't go. Anyway, I got burnt out when I came back out through Decon Station. I was burnt out and they took my Geiger counter, my film badge, and my dosimeter away from me for three days. Wouldn't let me go back in because I was burnt out. I was on a DER, which is a destroyer escort radar picket ship. And so we were like the secret ships, uh, like the Pueblo, that was captured by Korea. We had dual missions, but most of it was uh, weather. And uh, we'd send up weather balloons and track them. And uh, out there also in North Pacific when we were there was for, uh, in case an airplane went down, it was rescue. In 62, uh, shortly after I was aboard that vessel, we were told we were going to participate in this Operation Dominic uh, in the Pacific uh, Joint Task Force 8, uh, is what it was called. The one that I did see, actual see, the one that was above us was enough to knock out the uh, communications and light up the islands of Hawaii. We were under, directly underneath. They told us, you know, you're not taking any radiation, we won't have it. But we did go into, right after the explosion, everybody went inside and we washed down the vessel. They had uh, piping all around the, each level with nozzles and uh, the superstructure and the bridge decks and even up on top of the flybridge uh, had ways to, uh, nozzles to, to actually, uh, was using salt water, pumping salt water and washing it down. Well, I was 18 years old, so to me, or 19, uh, yeah, I was 18, just turned 19, I guess, and so to me, it was exciting. Yeah, I wanted to participate. I joined the Navy. I wasn't drafted. Uh, I wanted to participate in everything, so everything I did was, was rather exciting. Of course, you, when you're there and you don't have uh, family or anything else, you have a whole different outlook than the, the guys that had families. Uh, I know there was a lot of apprehension among the, my shipmates that had families back in Hawaii. It was just fear of, uh, of, of the unknown, of what might happen, you know, if something went wrong or, you know, uh, I think that's part of it. Even after it happened, then there was probably more apprehension after it happened than before. Uh, how much radiation are we going to take? How, you know, what's this going to do to us, you know? Uh, is this wash down on the ship going to work? How long does that radiation stay in the air? Uh, a lot of questions that we never did get answered. I'd seen explosions uh, on film in the, uh, Nevada. And uh, so when you think about it and the size uh, of a hydrogen bomb compared to an atom bomb, you know, we, we sensed it. We knew that this was something that was unique, something that had never been done before, uh, an explosion that high and, and that big. So yeah, there was a real sense of power that, uh, of the destruction capabilities of what it could do.